Helicopters are used all over the world for transporting passengers. But the most important use for them is rescuing people from areas that are difficult to get to by land. I'm here at Her Majesty's Coast Guard base in North Wales to meet an amazing rescue helicopter and her crew. The helicopter behind me is used to rescue people in need from the sea or from the mountains. If someone hurts themselves on top of a mountain, it's impossible to get an ambulance up there, so the Coast Guard's called. A rescue can come any time of day or the middle of the night, and it sounds as if the crew have a rescue call coming in now. They all spring to action at once. First, they look at a map of the area to check for any dangers and work out the best route. Just look at this amazing tractor pulling the helicopter out of the hangar. Now it's time for the crew to put their special safety gear on. Everything has a purpose. This life-saving jacket will inflate so that the crew member floats in water. And it even has its own air supply, just in case they find themselves underwater and need to breathe fresh air. Then, it's out to the helicopter to fly! On board are pilot Mike, Captain Kate, John the winch operator and Tomo the winch man. It's Tomo's job to get lowered out of the helicopter to rescue someone on the ground. After a few safety checks, it's time for takeoff. This whole process, from call to flight, takes the crew under 15 minutes. Engine start! Look at how fast those rotors can turn. The rotors chop through the air and make everything around them very windy. Whoa! I can hardly stay on my feet! Red Mechanical! Let's use your super slow motion camera to see just how many times those rotors are turning. I love using Gecko Super Slow Mo, mainly because it just looks cool. But look, a helicopter's rotor blades can spin 10 times per second. Oh dear, are you okay, Red Mechanical? As the rotors spin faster, the helicopter lifts off the ground and flies into the air. Captain Kate controls the helicopter by pointing the rotor blades in the direction she wants the helicopter to fly. Today the crew are practicing their winching skills using a dummy instead of a real person. The pilot skillfully hover over the area just above where the dummy is. Tomo clips himself to the winch and John carefully lowers him down. Tomo would then check how poorly the person on the ground is before winching both of them back up to the helicopter safely. Nicely done team! Back at base the engineers are always on hand to make sure the helicopters are in the best working order and ready to fly. Safety is the most important thing and these engineers are the best in the business. It's a real team effort keeping these amazing helicopters flying and rescuing people in need. This is Tom and Kev. Tom's a pilot and Kev is a winch operator. They're going to give us a quick tour inside the helicopter. Welcome everyone to the S92 Search and Rescue Helicopter. First and foremost, very importantly, we've got two large winches here. And these winches have got two straps. And the idea of this is we can lower these down to people in the water or on a mountain and pick them up and take them to safety. So let's look inside now in the aircraft itself. 
And as you can see, as you come into this helicopter, it's a large space. Here we've got a camera which we use when we're searching for people. This can pick up people on the water, on the mountainside. So when we've picked up our patient, which we've taken off the hoist, we bring them into, into the aircraft itself and we can put them onto this, our stretcher. And they may well be in the stretcher, but this is a lovely area for us to work on them and make them feel comfortable in the aircraft and we can give them medical treatment if they require it. Once we get to the hospital, we need to get our patient out of the aircraft safely and the best way we can do that is we lead them and lift them off here down through the ramp itself off the aircraft into the hospital where they can be looked after. Okay this is the cockpit of the helicopter there are two pilots one sits here in this chair and the other one sits on the other side these are the controls to fly the helicopter this one moves the helicopter forwards and backwards and this one moves it up and down and then there's two pedals down on the floor as well and that keeps the helicopter straight. We've got two engines and they're controlled on these screens and then we've got a map in the middle to see where we're going. Thanks very much to the amazing team here at the Coast Guard base. I'm here at Truck Fest to meet a really big machine. A monster truck. Whoa! Look at the size of the wheels on that thing. One of my best friends is a monster truck and he'd really like to meet Big Red over here. Come along, Max. Come and say hello to Big Red. Who do you think is bigger? Max or Big Red? Big Red's only built for taking passengers on a ride on his back. Look how much fun that looks. But I'm here to meet a stunt monster truck. A monster truck that crushes and jumps cars. This is Swamp Thing. A huge monster truck that weighs as much as two elephants. Swamp Thing is 14 feet tall. That's almost as tall as a giraffe. Let's take a look at Swamp Thing in action. Three, two, one, go! Wow, just look at those cars getting crushed! The monster truck is so heavy that when it lands on the cars they are squashed as flat as a pancake. Swamp Thing is a really amazing monster machine. I wonder what it's like to drive a monster truck. This is Swamp Thing's driver, Tony. He's using his tools to perform a safety check on Swamp Thing. He's checking that all the nuts and bolts are tight so that a wheel doesn't fall off in the middle of a show. Tony, what's it like to drive a monster truck? To drive a monster truck, for me, it's the best job in the world. I saw it on TV when I was about eight years old and I never thought I'd be doing it for a living. Um, the feel you get in there, it's so noisy, so bumpy, but the adrenaline keeps you going. How do you get in Swamp Thing? Most people think you climb on the tyres, but I'll show you how you get in. It's fairly simple. Just walk around the side of it. Doors don't open. What you got is a climbing frame and literally you just climb up on the inside. And then you're straight in the seat. Okay, how do you drive a monster truck? Literally, we've got one pedal for go and one pedal for stop. That's the starting and stopping. Now we've got to work out how to steer it. Front wheels is just like a car, turns in a steering wheel. Unlike a normal car, we've got back steering. So this turns on a joystick, left and right on the back. So who's ready to crush some cars?
Tony built this monster truck himself, using lots of different parts, from lorries and diggers. He knows it inside out. When Tony takes Swamp Thing around the country, he can't take it on the roads. So the monster machine has to travel in Tony's massive lorry. Swamp Thing has many of the things that a normal car would have, only they're much, much bigger. There's the wheels, the engine, the exhaust, the suspension, which gives Tony a softer landing, the brakes, the chassis, and the cabin. All of these things are designed so that Swamp Thing can jump, like this. I'm here at the Gresford Miniature Railway to meet some mini steam trains. These trains are exactly the same as real steam engines, except much, much smaller. But that means they're really fun to ride on. The mechanicals didn't want to come with me today. They said they only want to see big vehicles. Those silly mechanicals don't know what they're missing out on. This is David, and he's a model engineer and mini train driver. This is his locomotive, and it's called the Royal Air Force. It took David 12 years to build this special locomotive, and today we're going to send it whizzing around the track. This part is called the tender, and it's where coal and extra water can be stored. Now that David's train is safely on the track, it's time to transfer it onto a steaming bay. This is where the fire inside the locomotive can be lit, and the boiler gets filled up with water. This process is called steaming up. First, David uses this pump to fill the boiler with lots of water. The boiler is inside this part here. More water can then be poured into the tender to keep the boiler topped up when the train is running. OK, Jens, tea's ready. Hey, hey. And here's one for you, Gecko. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. Next, it's time to fill the firebox with coal. David has soaked these bits of coal in a liquid that makes them burn much faster. The fire is then lit from underneath the firebox. David builds the fire by shoveling more mini pieces of coal into the firebox. As the fire heats the water in the boiler, the pressure builds up and has to escape somewhere. And... Woo! There it goes! A quick oil around the parts and cylinders to keep everything moving smoothly and we're ready to go! David's friend Paul swings the track over, and it's full steam ahead. Coal is the fuel for this steam train, and David needs plenty to power the train around the track. A quick stop at the coal store to load up the tender, to make sure we have enough coal for the day. To let David's train onto the main track, Brian here needs to change the points. He checks no other trains are coming, 
pulls these levers and the track magically moves all by itself. Green means go! Woo! Now David can whiz around the track. The mechanicals are missing this. It looks so much fun. So, David, how do you drive a mini train? Well, first of all, you need coal for the fire. You put the coal into the firebox, and uh, that makes the fire. And the fire boils the water in the boiler, and the steam from the, the boiled water is then taken off down to the cylinders, which drives the engine and this lever is called the regulator and we just turn that and then the engine will start going forwards. Hey mechanicals have you been here all along? Do you want to have a ride? David the mechanicals are so excited that they're letting off their own steam. Come on, mechanicals, jump aboard. Mechanicals love these mini trains almost as much as these children. Well, Mechanicals, did you have fun after all? Thanks so much to David and all the model engineers at Gresford Miniature Railway for teaching us all about these amazing trains. I'm spending the day with a real Stobart energy lorry. But look, something's missing. Do you know what it is? Yes, that's it. We're missing the big trailer from the back. Let's hook it on. This is Andy and he's the driver of this lorry. Andy starts the engine by turning this key. He puts the lorry in reverse gear and carefully backs towards the trailer. Back a bit, Andy. Little bit more. There. Andy now has to do a few things to fully connect the trailer. He has to connect the hydraulic pipes and electrical lines. This means everything on the trailer can now be controlled from the cab. Andy then winds the trailer legs up. He turns off the trailer brake and fits the number plate onto the back. It's then back into the cab to test that everything's all attached. Brilliant! That looks a lot more like a lorry now. Andy, what's the best thing about driving a lorry? I really love life on the open road. You get to see a lot of interesting places around the country. Would you uh, like to see my truck? Yes, please. The front part of the lorry is called the cab. And this is where the driver sits. So Gecko, this is my cab, it's got all the usual things that you'd expect and some special surprises too. This is a steering wheel, it was up and down in every position that you'd want it to go, it's really really good. 
just here this switch here that turns all the lights on and this here is the all important horn and I also have a bed in the back it's really really comfy because Andy has to do very long drives his cosy cabin has a comfy bed for him to sleep in at night there's all sorts of other things in here to make sure Andy's comfortable for his long journeys. There's some curtains and a reading light. Wakey, wakey, Andy. It's time to go out on the road. So before the journey, Andy walks around the lorry doing his safety checks. Wow, there's a lot of wheels to check. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Each Stobart lorry is unique and gets given its own name. This lorry is called Demi Nicole. Right, Gecko, we're good to go. Hop in. We're off to pick up some waste wood that would normally go straight in the bin. Stobart Energy pick up this wood in their lorries and turn it into electricity to power homes. It's amazing! Andy presses a button to open the roof sheet of the empty trailer. He then jumps back in the cab where it's safe. This very clever vehicle is called a grab and it's used to load up Andy's trailer. The driver uses the grabber to pick up lots of wood and drop it into the back. To make sure the driver of the grab can see over the top of the trailer, the cab can go up and down. Wow, I've never seen that before. It looks like we're full, so it's time for Andy to put the top back on, hop back in and take this waste wood back to base. Base, Andy opens the back doors. He presses this button to start emptying the trailer. Inside the trailer is an amazing moving floor which moves the wood backwards. It then tips out of the back. Once out, it's then time for another big vehicle to come along and pick up the wood. This is called a loading shovel and it loads the wood into this big machine which chops it into much smaller pieces. These small pieces have now become special wood fuel which can be burned in a power station. This amazing material has come from wood that would normally have been buried underground as rubbish. The lorry is reloaded with the wood fuel and then driven to the special biomass power station. This power station can power 35,000 homes. Andy carefully reverses into the bay and tips the wood fuel off. The wood fuel travels underground, up a conveyor belt and is then burned heating water to produce steam, a bit like a steam train. The steam turns a big turbine or wheel which creates electricity. Thanks very much to Andy and all the team here at Stobart Energy for teaching us all about this amazing lorry. Gecko here! And I'm so bonkers excited! 
Why? Because today I'm learning all about fire trucks at this amazing fire station. How cool is that? Fire trucks are used all over the world to help firefighters put out fires and rescue people who are trapped in hard to reach places. We're going to meet two different fire trucks today and we get to meet the brilliant crew members of Lim Fire Station. These amazing fire trucks and firefighters are experts at, you guessed it, putting out fires. They use these super long wiggly hoses, a bit like what we see in the garden, but super powerful. And look, they even have special masks that protect them from the heat. This is Jay, and he's the watch manager, which is what they call the leader of the team. Firefighter Hill, door number four. Also, I'd like to welcome uh, Gecko, uh, who's going to learn to be a firefighter for the day. Thanks for having me, White Watch. Well, look who's here. Blue and Green Mechanical have come to learn about fire trucks too. Make sure you two stay out of trouble, please. This is Laura and Ellen. They're both firefighters in White Watch. What are you doing now, Laura? Well, Gecko, we're getting ready for the starter shift. This involves getting all our kit out so that we're ready for any emergency that we might come across. So as you can see, Ellen's put her boots out ready. She's also got both the jackets, a helmet and the gloves. So she's ready for any emergency we might come across. Speed is always of the essence, so it's important that it's all laid out properly. Everyone, meet Andy. He's the driver of the fire truck. He's making sure everything is OK for the next emergency call-out. But what is an emergency call-out? Well, that's when people ring up and tell the firefighters they need help. And remember, it's very important to check that the truck's lights are working properly. They need to flash really brightly when the truck leaves the station to let people know help is coming. I love this fire truck. Do you know why? It's because there's so many secret places to store the amazing life-saving equipment. Look, Ellen and Laura are checking the hydraulic cutting equipment. These are like a big pair of scissors. But instead of cutting through paper, they cut through metal. Now mechanicals, you're going to have to stop messing around. This isn't a place for messing around, guys. We don't want to end up rescuing you, do we? Once Andy and the gang have checked that the truck is OK, Laura and Ellen need to make sure their breathing apparatus works safely. This is what they use when it gets really smoky inside a building that's on fire. It's very important that they can breathe clean air. Psst! Guess what, everybody? There's actually more than one fire truck in this fire station. This one here is called the ALP, which stands for Aerial Ladder Platform. Should we all say it together? Aerial Ladder Platform. Now the team use this Alp truck when they need to rescue people from places that are just way too high for the ladder. Wowzers! It sounds like someone's in trouble. Come on Gecko, get your gear on, we've got a job. That's one of those emergency calls that we talked about a minute ago. Remember? Yeah. 
all of the important stuff we need to know about the rescue comes through on this piece of paper. OK, all three appliances, mechanicals stuck at height, in limp. Oh no, it sounds like the mechanicals are in trouble. We'd better go and rescue them. Now that we've got our kit on, it's time to move out. Oh dear, it looks like those silly mechanicals are stuck at the top of that tower and can't get down. We'll have to use the ladder to go all the way up there and get them. Look at this amazing teamwork. The crew all work together to get this ladder up as quickly and as safely as possible. Oh dear, it looks like the ladder isn't quite high enough to reach the mechanicals. Hmm, now, what can we use instead? That's right, bring in the help! To make sure the help doesn't wobble, Andy and James use these controls to move these things called jacks out of the side of the truck. They look like metal legs and they stick out and lift the truck off the ground. Wow, that's really heavy, but these jacks are so strong, they stop the Alp from falling over. Whoa, look at that. It's got super strength, like super mechanical. Once the Alp is stable, which means it won't wobble, Andy jumps into the operating seat. That's the one that works the machinery. James is so brave. Look, he's going up in the cage to rescue the mechanicals. Now, because he's going up very high, he clips himself on using this harness, so he can't fall off. The harness is a bit like a belt you wear around your trousers. When you fasten it, your trousers don't fall down. OK, here goes. Up, 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 up into the sky! James is now in control of the cage, and he can move up, down, left, and right with these joysticks. Almost there. Hold on, mechanicals. We're coming to save you. Gotcha. Phew. I'm glad those mechanicals are safe. Thanks, James and Andy. OK, Mechanicals, I hope you learnt your lesson there. You shouldn't be climbing up towers and being silly, because we've got other people to rescue, OK? I've loved spending time with the firefighters and the amazing fire trucks today. Have you ever seen one of these before? It's a concrete mixer. These amazing construction trucks are used all over the world to help build roads, houses and even schools. But how do they work? And why does this big drum have to spin around? Come on, 
Let's find out. These big trucks are perfect for carrying and delivering a material called concrete. There's some wet concrete on the floor there. Watch out, Blue Mechanical! But what is concrete? Concrete is a mix of sand, water and cement. Cement's a bit like glue. Something amazing happens when you mix these three things together. They become concrete. And when it's dry, it's as hard as rock. Uh, Blue, were you paying attention to what I was just saying? Concrete is rock solid when it sets. Oh dear, Blue. It looks like you're stuck fast. This is why concrete mixers are the only trucks that can carry concrete. To stop it from setting and turning rock hard, you have to keep mixing it. This is the drum and it's where the concrete is stored. Connected to the drum is a gearbox and motor which spins it this way and that way. Rollers on the other end of the drum keep everything turning nice and smoothly. This part here is called the hopper and it's where the concrete gets poured into the drum. There's Danny. He's the driver of this truck. He's off to pick up a fresh batch from the concrete plant. He reverses carefully into the loading bay. To load up, Danny has to perfectly line up the hopper with the loading chute. Up in the plant control room, they can create just the right mix for Danny's batch. Then it's time to load up. Whilst he's waiting, Danny tops up the onboard water tank. It's very important to have plenty of water on board, because clever computers inside the mixer test the concrete. They can add more water if it starts to get a bit too dry. It's a bit like porridge. Too dry or too wet, and it's no good. Just like Goldilocks, we want it just right. We're fully loaded, so let's go! Mechanicals! That's a very dangerous place to stand. You should never stand that close to a big truck like this. And even with all his mirrors and cameras, Danny can't see you there if he's turning. It's much safer to stand further away from the mixer. The drum is turning and we're heading to Danny's customer to drop this load off. At this huge factory, they make massive buildings out of concrete. So they need lots and lots of concrete mixers visiting all the time. Inside the drum, there's blades that mix the concrete as it turns. To empty the load, Danny makes the drum spin the opposite way, which pushes the concrete mix out. The concrete is emptied into this big container which can be moved around the factory with huge cranes. They're using this mix to build a wall. The concrete is poured into this ready-made mould, which is just the right size for the wall. Just a few days later, and the concrete has properly set. Now it looks a lot more like a wall. The walls are then loaded onto this big lorry, 
ready to be delivered to the construction site and turned into a building. The last part of the process is for Danny to wash out the hopper, ready for the next batch. Thanks very much to Danny and all the team at Tarmac for teaching us all about these amazing concrete mixers. And thank you for watching. To watch more videos from me, just tap here. For now, it's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye!